We are live. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Average Superstar TV. I am your host, Laura Lepery. Please give the like, subscribe, share, and feel free to comment. Uh, and this week, we got I got a really special guest going on here. This is a guy who's been in a lot of movies we all know very well, for everything from The Children of the Corn to The Return of the Living Dead to the almighty ex-presidents from, from Point Break. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome John Philbin. John, welcome to the show. So glad to have uh, someone like you on my show. I... Thanks, Lauren. Awesome. Glad awesome. to be here. Awesome. So yeah, you're involved with two um, two important things. I'm I'm an actor, filmmaker myself, but at the same time, I've always been drawn to surfing. So I'm kind of I'd love to go over those two eras. So. Did you always want to be an actor, or is it just something you saw at one point and said, "Yeah, I'm going to jump in on that"? Where did no? Where did... I always wanted to be an actor. I mean, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I started acting in the theater, and I loved it. It was very special. I had a really magic teacher, Chip Hipkins, in high school, Palos Verdes High School, and we had a, a really strong drama department, and we competed all around California. And I was, I got lucky enough to be in these shows that won awards in these festivals and it really made me feel like I was good at something you know that I could do something special <clears throat> and uh, I went to college up at UC Santa Barbara and I tried to be an econ major because it wasn't very practical to want to be an actor even though it was the thing I was best at in high school without a doubt I had something it really did something special for me and I you know but when I was in college, I looked around and saw the different studies. I studied general ed. Now, there's nothing I'm interested in more than acting. So I transferred to USC to study acting for and to live in Hollywood because I knew I wanted to be a you know a film actor. So I wanted to live in Los Angeles. So I, I got lucky enough to get into the USC you know Conservatory for Fine Arts and just studied acting for three years. When I got out of there, I just did some, some plays in Los Angeles. Till I got an agent. And then I think Children of the Corn was my very first movie that I ever did. And uh, I was a full time actor for like 20 years, 80s and through the 90s. What well, stay right where you're at there. So Children of the Corn, it's a it's an iconic horror film. It's one of Stephen King's like most popular books. I remember um, seeing that on the video shelf when I was quite a young lad and uh, my parents were like, you're not renting that. They, they, I wasn't allowed to rent horror movies and stuff. Kill but, your parents. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were good at the bit. Like they, they really kept the good tabs on me to my early teens, you know, of what I could watch, what I can't. But so how did you find out about that? Was that an agent thing? Was that something? Yeah, I had, I had already been cast in a movie called Grandview USA. I'd been cast in it and we were going to shoot it in, in Illinois, but I had like, five or six weeks before I had to report to the location and children of the corn had this was starting right away and they needed this one part, this kind of interesting, different part. And my agent was like, Hey, this guy just got cast in a big movie. He's available in your time frame. It'd be cool if he got a little horror movie under his belt and you could Taft Hartley him. And so I went in and read grit and um, I got children of the corn. It's the second movie I got and I haven't shot anything yet. So I went to the set I went to, you know, to Iowa, Sioux City, Iowa, or somewhere in Iowa, and Pont, and then, yeah, we shot Children of the Corn, my first movie, yeah, and I, I was like, I was using it to train for a really good movie that I was shooting after that, and now, 40 years later, I'm talking about Children of the Corn, not that other movie. <laughs> that other movie is like Grandview, USA, and it had Patrick Swayze, Jennifer Jason Lee, you know, C. Thomas Howell, John Cusack, I mean, an insane cast, and it was I played this great part and a great director and everything. But a lot of the, you look at the horror world and, you know, a lot of those, these other movies, they just kind of fade into the background, but horror movies, if they touch a chord in people, like they just, they're alive forever. They're with you forever. Yeah, it is. It's just, it's just like, I don't know, either hanging on to your youth or it's just, you know, we just love them so much, you know? 
We love them. I love them too. I mean, they they have a big part in my youth. So yeah, love love horror. So like, is there any how how long were you there on set? How many days doing that? I was probably in in Iowa for like three weeks, maybe four weeks, and I spent most of my time researching for my next role. My next role was a pretty challenging, physically mentally handicapped person. You know, and I was working mostly with Jamie Lee Curtis and Tommy Howell. And I was and and I was like, I was, you know, going to these community centers that work with that had, you know, mentally handicapped people. I was like playing bingo a lot and studying the motions and the sounds they were making. And then because because I figured I could do the part of Amos as like kind of clo- very close to myself as I'm about to do something I'm terrified of, but I'm going to have ultimate confidence. And I'm just kind of like in a, a zoned out space of like self-created euphoria because I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm a sacrificial lamb. And so I was really able to, I didn't have to study anything different from what I was going through in order to play a guy that was scared, but going to do this thing. And that for me was working on film. Mm-hmm. You know, you're rolling, the camera's rolling and I'm supposed to say this line now. And, you know, it was very easy to go from what I was going through as a person, you know, and move it into what I was, you know, what I was going through as an actor and to move it into the character. That's awesome. So, I mean, did on the side, did you get to like talk to Linda Hamilton? And Of and course. Yeah, her, yeah, we all talked to everybody. You know, yeah. I wasn't there as long as the other kids. I didn't get to work with Courtney Gaines and John Franklin very much. They're both, they've, I've become close friends with them now, like kind of like family. They're just such, I mean, I don't think it's very normal in films and every actor says this, you know, films are weird. You work on a film, you could become best friends, you love everybody and then you never see them again. Yeah. In these horror movies, you work on the film then you never see them again. And then 20 years later, the film becomes a cult classic and you get to see them and they're just, they, you know, John Franklin and Courtney Gaines are the most amazing kid. They're just, they're not kids anymore. No. But as men, yeah. they're just fantastic. And it, we're like kind of starting out a little family as, they, you know, because I just joined the Children of the Corn, you know, convention circuit. I, I signed with Chris Rowe Management and, and th- because they invited me to. And I'm like, I would love to do these shows with you guys. And they're so smart and so funny. And so kind. It just turned out that, you know, we all really like each other, which doesn't happen all the time. But, you know, I guess maybe it happens now in the Marvel Universe. I don't know. But, yeah, we're all like family. We love each other. That's great. So when you are, I guess, like when you're out there in the middle of Iowa, that's where you were shooting. Yeah. Were you guys in the middle of nowhere or was there kind of a town close by where you guys like when you weren't shooting could kind of, you know, like. Yeah. There's a town, there was a town close by. I was staying in a hotel. I had a weird schedule because I didn't work with the pack. Yeah. I'm out there working every day and, you know, yeah. and I just get called in like three days, you know, out over or four or five days over two week period. You know, the rest of the time I'm like spending per diem. I'm in a nice hotel. I've never been on a movie set. I've never been paid to go stay in a hotel. I'm like spending all my per diem at the mall. Like, uh, like as if that mall is different from any other mall. I'm like, look at this leather jacket I bought, you know? And I'm like, what? people are like, what do you need a leather jacket for? I don't know. You know, I got it in the mall with my per diem. And people are like, you should probably, you should probably think about saving some of that. Yep. I was like, why? Because, you know, they were more experienced than me. I just thought, oh, I'm on a movie. And then when I finish this, I'm going to do another movie. So my life is going to be like this for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, I was so excited. I'm going to I'm going to do research for another movie when I'm not I I don't have a day off. I have no friends. I have nothing to fucking do. I'm going to the mall with, you know, an envelope of per diem. Back they don't, you know. It was just mind-blowingly fun and different for me. I made all million mistakes, but I learned that, you know, no one was over there telling me what to do necessarily. It sounds though like you just fell into the category of not just an actor or anybody, but young with money. You you think it's just not going to end. You young know? money forever. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I made it. I made it. Ma, look at me. I'm at the top <laughs> of the world. And, you know, that is great. You know, it was great for the moment, but I had no, I had no real, you know, maturity, you know, or frugal, you know, I had nobody, I'd know, I never knew anybody in the entertainment industry, you know, like no one was like saying, here's what you should do. No one was, I, I didn't have a council or anything. I was just 
young and wild and free. And I wasn't even young. I had graduated college. I wasn't like some little kid that just hit it. I'd already been to college. So, so uh, I wasn't that young. I really don't have any good excuse for my behavior. But it was we'll, fun. We'll just call it a life lesson. Yeah. Life lesson. Lesson learned. So and another film that you definitely, I mean, I'm sure you got a couple in between you can maybe chat about too, but you're in one of the most iconic, what we like to call in the punk rock scene, like one of the most punk rock movies of all and uh, The Return of the Living Dead. So the very first one, it's funny because I saw the second one before I saw the first one just due to my age. I mean, the second one hit TV. And I remember going back and seeing the first one and I was, you know, 12 year old mind. I was quite confused with Thomas Matthews being in book. I was like, well, uh, I didn't know what was going on. But uh, yeah. So tell us what that experience was like. <laughs> okay. There was an actor strike going on in Hollywood. I'd done like four films and my agent goes, hey, there's a really interesting director, Dan O'Bannon, doing a horror film. And it's interesting. It's got punk rock music. He wants it. It's a zombie film. I'm like. Well, I'll, I'll go in. I'd love to go in on it because no one's working right now. It'd be great to get a job doing something. But I, I read the script and I go, I could play this this nerd. You know, I was a full on punk rock kid, but I was I wasn't full hardcore, you know, like Mark Venturini's character. I was more new wave because in my real life, I love punk rock and everything. But I would go to clubs and dance and I was kind of a new wave guy. I wasn't hardcore punk rock. And so I just totally, you know. I identified with this character. I went in and read for it like four or five times. And the and and Dan O'Bannon put us together with all these different kids and would rehearse scenes over and over and over again until he saw chemistry he liked. And then he put out the offers and we got and I got the job and I was thrilled because, you know, the the un, a union had gone on strike and we had got in under the we're working anyway. We're in Hollywood making a movie, you know, and and I it's a bunch of kids. I knew I knew Tom Matthews. You know, and I had be, and Brian Peck also went to USC. So I knew him, too, because I went to USC, graduated USC. I'd only been out of USC about a year, maybe a year and a half. And, uh, you know, it was super fun. It shot in L.A. So I was in my city. I got to drive to locations in my car, you know, and show up at the studio and just have a green room that we'd change in and hang out in. And they built studios and we had some outside exterior locations, which I love. You know, I love and we shot at night a bunch of times, which was really kind of fucking spooky and cool. So, you know, I really didn't know what was going on in the rest of the film. I just knew what was going on in my scenes. So when I saw the film, I had no idea all that shit was going on, even though I'd read the script. But if I'm not in the scene at that time, it was hard for me to understand why I would be reading the script. But uh, no, it was really fucking. You're worried, you're worried about your own performance, not to sound selfish, but I, I totally understand you. You want to be able to knock it out of the ballpark. So, it, you know. Actors are understand, you know, like I'm just interested in being the best I can be and what, what you know, when the camera's on me. And and that, I, I love that. Movie. The more I watch it, the more I'm like, yeah, that's fucking cool, man. Nobody knew what Dan O'Bannon was doing, but Dan O'Bannon, he's a real genius. To make those zombies, you know, fast and funny and to play punk rock music and make it a comedy zombie movie. It's the first zombie, you know, yeah. now that's become a, you know, cliche genre. But he's the first guy to invent a genre of zombie movie, comedy zombie, zombie movies. R.I.P., man. He's so awesome. And that's another cast. that We're like we're totally like family now. I didn't see those people for 20 years, you know, and then then I get to see him at a big screening and there's a bunch of people who loved the movie and God couldn't make me happier. I mean, I'm really I'm so lucky I got involved in those two movies, you know, cause they've given me like a second career. Like I had, they've given me the convention horror convention career where I get to meet all people I love and fans that I love. And it's just a really a wonderful thing that I've learned to appreciate and really love and enjoy. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Did, did you get any of like the punk rock bands? during like those years that like recognized you from the movie and like would pop when they saw you or now? Not to my knowledge. No one ever came up to me and said, you, it happens now. Yeah. But back then I was moving on, doing other work, you know, like, you, you know, young actors do horror movies generally back in those days when they were the only thing you could get. Like if you could get a horror movie, that's good, you know, cause you're young, you're not a star, yeah. you're not on a TV show. You don't have like, you know, you're a young actor, you do horror movies. If, you, if you're lucky, you know, you get into a couple horror movies. That's how, why I did them, you know, for experience and, you know, for, you know, uh, exposure, you know. 
but I never thought they would amount to anything. I never thought they would be, you know, anything other than someone saw them that weekend. I love horror movies, you know, and that's it. But they became something that no one could have anticipated. So after that, some people, and it freaks me out because I'm in a surfing world and another act, you know, acting world. And when someone knows me as Chuck from Return of the Living Dead, it just, I love it. I don't, that doesn't happen to me very often unless I'm at a convention. But if it happens once a year, I'm like, oh, that person knows me from Return of the Living Dead. I have a special place in my heart for that person. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, and you're, you're definitely right on. I mean, like Brad Pitt was like in cutting class. Jennifer Anderson was in the first Leprechaun. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it's a start, you know? Yeah, Trisha Arquette. Yeah, I mean, people do, hor- young actors do horror movies. Usually it's how they start. Yep. You know, Jamie Lee Curtis is an example of that. By far. And she was almost like typecasted at for a while. You know, she couldn't even get out of that. But, but, you know, and now she's back doing them again. (laughs) The wheel turns for everyone. If you can just stay alive, Uh the wheel will turn. It turns for us all. Uh (laughs) It's awesome. So, and I know your surfing world led you obviously into the Point Break movie. I think so. I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've always surfed, you know, I started surfing young and surfing is really important to me. And I think my fifth movie uh, in Hollywood, you know, but the, I got it. I got a, I'd done like four movies and I got a strip to play a character named Turtle in a movie called North Shore, which films on the North Shore of Oahu, which is the mecca of the surfing world. And it's and they had cast a bunch of pro surfers, real surfers who were my idols growing wow. up, you know, besides Montgomery Cliff and James Dean. Jerry Lopez, Rory, you know, Mark Acalupo, you know, Laird Hamilton, these guys were heroes of mine. In in my favorite activity besides acting, surfing and acting are my two favorite activities. And uh, I said, I got to be in this movie. It was hard to get into. It was hard to get, man. I mean, you had to surf and they didn't really see me as that character, but I worked so hard and I, and it, it ended up being like the best experience of my life, you know, and it, and it, And I don't know if that's why I got Point Break, but North Shore made such a big impression on the surfing world and and it crossed over into the acting world because I was a big character. And I think Universal Studios put it out and people were they were going to do this bank robbing movie. Point Break's a bank robbing movie, but it takes place in the surfing world. And the casting directors and directors were looking for some authenticity. And so I think that the reason that I'm not sure I'll never know why or how I got into Point Break if it wasn't from just my acting or if it was from the work I had done in North Shore. But whatever reason it was, I got cast in this that part of Nathaniel in Point Break. And, you know, I got to work with Patrick Swayze again and meet and work with Keanu Reeves, who I'll love for the rest of my life. And I'm really good friends with Bo Jesse and, and James Legros. You know, we've become, we're all, you know, I love those guys. And so it's been, and Gary Busey. You know, I'm a surfer, so my favorite surf movie is Big Wednesday and Gary Busey plays the master. Oh gosh, I have that. I still have it on DVD. Yep, yep. So my surfing for me personally, and not a lot of people know this, but my personal surfing claim to fame, everybody thinks it's something else, but it's that Gary Busey, who played the masochist in Big Wednesday, shoots Turtle, played by me in North Shore, shoots him in Point Break, which is the third, you know, those are the three best Hollywood surf movies ever made. Uh-huh. And uh, I get to be connected to them all. So I'm, yeah, that's a dream come true. Shit for I, me. I, I, is surfing. there even another good surfing movie since Point Break in 90? Like, really, is there any no, that jumps I mean, out? Yeah, they make some good small ones, you know. They made some yeah. really, really beautiful small ones. I think that uh, Bethany Hamilton made a really, really, you know, good one called Soul Surfer, you know, about her life. And, you know, she's an amazing person. I got to work on that because Helen Hunt gave me a job. And so I got to work with Bethany Hamilton on the North Shore during Soul Surfer. And then, you know, they made Surf's Up, which is a cartoon, which is really a lot of surfers think the best surf movie of all time. And they hired Kelly, you know, two real surfers to do some voiceovers and stuff but, and Jeff Bridges. But that's a great movie, but it's not a live action surf movie. I don't, you know, they tried to make a remake of point break that didn't work out oh, i i couldn't even do i'm one of them people i'm not a giant fan of of remakes if i like i just like what i saw and it's in my heart and point break is one of them movies like what why why do you need to touch it and put a cell phone in it i just you know yeah so, that was a mistake 
But, yeah. uh, you know, I hope if they make a TV series, I hope I can be on it as like an old cop or an old FBI agent or something like that or an old server. I don't care. It would be cool if they make a TV series out of that. And I guess that, to do- that obviously had to have taken a while. Like that chase scene between Keanu and, and Swayze through the houses and all that. Like that, that's God, that was a lot of detail and a lot of coverage on that yeah. alone. Catherine Bigelow, you know, she's an Academy Award winning director, but she hadn't won her Academy Award yet. But she was on her way. I mean, James Cameron was her partner at the time, and mm-hmm. they worked together, collaborated together on making that movie. And she's just a fucking visionary. And she knew Keanu Reeves could be a movie star and stand next to Patrick Swayze and hold his own on the screen. And he did. And he is. You know, and Patrick's as good as as big as they get as, mo- as movie stars go, you know. But she really knew he could do it, and he did. And uh, I'm so grateful she cast me in that movie, too, because that really made my my trilogy of surf movies. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what was that like? I mean, for, I, I mean the, the icon, he's the legend. He's no longer with us. What was it like, just his aura of who Patrick, Patrick? He was? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I the first movie I got, Grandview USA, which I went to shoot, you know, right after Children of the Corn. I worked with him on that. He was super cool. But I didn't get to know him that well, but he we were on the same movie, so we have something in common. So when I walked into the rehearsals for Point Break, there there was Buddy, you know, like he's got his wand and he passes around. I'm like, hey, man, you know, I don't know if he remembered me but from that movie, but he did eventually. I never said anything. I just pl- started playing that character from the day one I got there, and so did he. And so, I, you know, Patrick's a, there's no one like Patrick Swayze. I mean, there's no one like him. The guy, such a sweet gentleman you know and gets so concerned for other people and all and his actors that he's working with but when he's on screen he gives a hundred percent i don't know where he got his energy man but his energy was just coming from some other source so he's super nice and he took all us guys kids in his gang he just took us over and took us skydiving and took us water skiing and just took us everywhere up to his house in arrowhead and like just loved us and we loved him loved him you know and i just loved him and uh you know, I got to know him a little bit afterwards, just as not there's no one like Patrick Swayze. I mean, he just he was the real deal. I think he was more loved than than anybody because everybody who ever knew him or, you know, got to meet him or spend any time with him, you know, realized how special he was. And people just loved him so much. Yeah. And you and you were obviously probably what the what were you consider the point man for for all the surfing at done in the no, no i just me and me and bo knew how to surf you know but we weren't we they didn't hire us as surf instructors like i later became a surf instructor two movies okay you know because i saw it wasn't really you know i don't know i just saw that i could possibly it was something i could do when i stopped working as an actor i was like i don't know how to do anything else <laughs> oh yeah i know how to surf that's right i know how to surf i wonder if i could teach surfing and uh i i ended up making a career out of that for like 20 years i just did that today actually in malibu it was pretty cool I'm so glad I stayed alive. I went through a difficult time that I was lucky to survive. And now I'm alive and I get to teach surfing to people that were friends of mine. You know, when I was, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, they've got kids and I get to teach their kids how to surf and see them again. And it's just magic. I'm just so lucky. Yeah. man. It, I, I think you had a beautiful career friend. Yeah, you were so also, You were also in, I think I read tombstone. Tombstone. Yeah. I mean, that's, Oh, so lucky. Yeah. So I got cast in two. Kevin Jare just, I wasn't working much at the time. It was the nineties, I think. And I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? And then my agent colleague goes, Hey, you have an offer to do a Western. And I'm like a Western. That's great. And he goes, yeah, it's called tombstone. I'm like tombstone. Fuck. That's awesome. He goes, yeah, it's, it's by Kevin Jare. And the cast you're going to be working with is Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, Powers Booth, Sam Elliott, Bill Paxton, Billy Bob Thornton, Jason Priestley, John, and I was like, Michael Bean. What am, yeah. what am I gonna play? It's like you're gonna play Tom <laughs> Flowery, who's a real life cowboy that gets shot and killed in the OK Corral. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I don't have to. I didn't have to read for it. The, the, Kevin, the director, just saw my picture. He knew me. And he goes, That looks like just like Tom McClatchy, the guy I want to play. And I got an offer. For, I didn't have to read for it. And I'm like. Well, this is my lucky day, you know, and I went to Arizona and I was there from the first table reading through. They they replaced Kevin Jari with George Cosmatos. I came back. We took a little break while they reworked the script. And then I came back and I was there on the last day of filming for the whole thing in Tucson, Arizona. So I, again, just riding horses and shooting guns out in the two out in Arizona. And it was 
a fucking dream come true for any wannabe cowboy or actor, you know? Yeah, so well, it had to have been, and you, you got to do the shootout at the OK Corral. I mean, you I got know, to I'm in that. the shootout at the OK Corral. We yeah. rehearsed that so many times. One At one point, we got it down to this. We had a stopwatch and how many rounds were shot during the OK Corral and how many seconds it lasted. And we got it down to the, we got it right on the second and with exactly how many rounds. And then we just started breaking it into filming, but we did a master with it and it just, we hit our marks exactly. It was really exciting. That's really awesome. And I'd say like, on, you know, what's really, what Westerns do we, have we had that's really held this, the test of time in recent years since that, you know, I, 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 I always wonder what? Yeah, we got some Unforgiven. Westerns are making a comeback. Unforgiven right now. was, I think, a year before that may have even been. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wow, that's a good Western. But I mean, yeah, like Westerns are kind of making a comeback. I yeah. think it's like Yellowstone. Not, I don't yeah. know if they're Westerns. That's not a. That's awesome. That's my favorite show by far. Wow. God, what, I love it. How do you watch? What network is? I want to watch it. I hear nothing but good shit about it because I work with Kevin Costner. I love that guy. And I want to see his show. It's all on. It's for free on Peacock. For free. For free, you can watch. Well, I can go on my computer after this. Yes, you could. You, you, you could watch all three seasons. I'm not the they're the fourth one's now like out now. It's not done, so I don't think that's available yet. The for on Peacock at all. It's over, which uh, just get close. Yeah, and then well, they even have a prequel. After this. They got the prequel 1883, which is supposed to be the Dalton family. You know, right. back then, so. It's so worth it. Uh, I, I don't really watch a lot of TV. And last year, with everything going on, I kept hearing about it. I'm like, I'll give it one episode. And I, I, I shut my day down. I was like, oh, my God, this is freaking amazing stuff. But Peak, I had no idea it was free. Peacock.com, that's great. Free. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah, it's all NBC. And, uh, yeah, they, they got set up. But it's funny yeah. with their, uh, when you're talking about the OK Corral, I was just there. I was just in Tombstone. So, so yeah, so I was at the OK Corral, which burnt down. The one that's there currently now isn't the real one. And uh, I was at your character's grave. No yeah, way. They're all they're all buried, like literally. Yeah, like we got buried there. Yeah, they. Yeah, did they're, they like two, they're, they're literally two miles from the the, the strip of tombstone. So. Oh yeah. man, yeah, we did. We got. We had to do the scene when we're dead, and they put a ton of makeup on us. Oh, they had the pictures up and all that. Yeah, it's, it's got the exact oh, spot yeah? where Morgan died and all that. You gotta remember, oh, like. Back then, when there was a fire, they didn't know how. They didn't exactly have a fire department, so a lot of that stuff that's in Tombstone is just rebuilt up. It's like oh. a lot of it's gone. But you know, but yeah, the Coke Corral. You could go there and see the reenactment, and I did that. And uh, Johnny Ringo's grave's about an hour away. You know, really? Yeah, oh. yeah. Like right where at the end of the Tombstone movie, you know, the, there's a big thing of like. Did he kill himself? Did Wide Herb kill him, or did uh, Doc Holliday kill him? Because you know, for how for for uh, Hollywood purposes, that's the script they came up with. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, right the spot where you know, kind of where you know, in the movie, pretty much reenact is right where you know, what I saw. So they buried him right there. They just came and back then, when you were that much trouble, they came, confirmed you were dead, and they put you right in that spot. <laughs> So, yeah. How good was Michael Bain and Val Kilmer in that shootout? Like when Val shoots him in the fucking head and the guy's still alive and Michael Bain is still alive. That's some of the darkest, best work in the Western I've ever seen. The, to me, that, that was like beautiful. The, you were just sitting there like, these are two hardcore characters. You both, you like both of them. Yeah. <laughs> so it's got to go down, but it's just like, they were so dark and awesome, you know? Oh, that was just as good as movies get, I think. Yeah. I mean, that, that whole, that, the whole idea of that from start to finish, like every character, when you really look at every, you know, your character and everybody was involved with the gang, you're just like, if you pay attention, everyone's like a somebody. Yeah. From something, yeah. you know? Yeah. They, that You know, that's all thanks to Kevin Jari who wrote that script. Just an amazing, historical, beautiful screenplay. And he, yep. he and, you know, you know, because he put that cast together based on the script, because actors just look at what's on the page, you know, like, I mean, actors of that caliber, yeah. they just go, is, is something on the page here written that I could really do something with and enjoy and feel good about in my life, you know? And I mean, back then, not, I'm, I'm not saying that all actors work like that, but those yeah. actors, it's got to be on the page. That's what they're looking for. And Kevin yeah. Jare wrote such a beautiful, deep, long script 
that he got he was allowed to direct those stars even though he'd never directed a movie in his life but but the studios you know they're in it for the money so they're like at some point they had to go kevin this isn't working uh, you as a director thank you very much but we're gonna have to replace you with an action director george cosmatos who didn't understand the script or anything but he understood act action uh -huh. you know and that so that movie got they cut about a, you know, 80 pages out of the first script and and made the movie that it is today but there was so much good stuff in it. All those actors stayed. No one left. No one got replaced. I mean, everyone just said, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. It's not going to be the, the epic thing that it was going to be, but it's going to be with a very professional director. So it has a chance of being a big hit. And it turned out to be a big hit. It beat out that Kevin Costner, Wyatt Earp thing. Yeah. In, it was you like, know, you don't even, you don't even hear about that one. Like, yeah, I, I just, yeah. I, I think it was too much muscle with that one. You know, <laughs> it was just too good. I know we were, we were like, it, we were filming simultaneously and that that production company would go and buy a bunch of wardrobe shit that we wanted and they'd get some locations that we wanted and <laughs> kirk was like worried that kevin costner was going to kind of like you know because he was such you know kevin's such a big star you know like i don't think a, a star can be bigger than kurt russell though for all the movies he's done and how fucking awesome he is but i mean those guys are equal now but at the time Kevin Costner had all these Academy Awards. He just came off of Dances with Wolves. Like, yeah, you know? he was such a darling of Hollywood. And that, you know, we were kind of worried, like, uh, they're trying to, you know, get compete with us. You know, we're doing our thing. And as it turns out, and Kevin was a snob about it. He didn't think it was funny. You know, he thought he was better than everybody. You know, and I love Kevin. I've worked with him before, and I want to work with him again. But when, you know, Tombstone came out in White Earth, Tombstone just blew them away, you know, for all their high – Falutin kind of like they're they're too precious about it you know and yeah. we were just like fucking hardcore and we you know we we, we and people are still talking about tombstone you know like it's the classic now and I, so and that's you know that's a lot a lot thanks to kurt russell and val kilmer who put everything they had into that movie yeah I, mean, I, know, I know tons of people that don't even like westerns but when you say tombstone it's like you like that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah you're yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's just something wrong with you if you don't. But yeah, what was it? What, what would you say? Like, what's what's your if if you if the world ended at midnight? What's the film that 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 you would sign off on? What would you say was like your North Shore? North I would Shore. sign. You know, North Shore was this movie that I play a character in that has become kind of iconic in the surfing world, but it introduced me to this world of surfing that I could have never entered just as in my own recreational surfer. It introduced me to the hardcore world of international surfing all over the world. And it became a cult film in that community. And, um, and I still have friends from it and I can go all around the world, the surfing world and know somebody like I, it just introduced me to this surfing, the, the highest end of the surfing world. And I'm eternally grateful. You know, I, it's, it's really informed my life after I made it. It is one of those, it was a sleeper. Nobody saw it. And then it came out on VHS. And then it came out on cable and it developed this cult following, just like a lot of horror movies do, but from, it's from the eighties. And it just, it just came, became this thing that all the kids and all the families and all the surfers have to see. And luckily for me, I play a very likable character, a very recognizable character. And so it's just become this thing in my life that it's the one it's probably the one movie i've done that has most informed my life you know and i'm most i'm most recognized from and grateful for and i still a, a hardcore surfer so it really has been been the, the best combination of film and life for me and it just luckily for me it just keeps going and it's people just love watching it new next generations like it gotcha and that's definitely a big part of your life is surfing did, yeah yeah, I, yeah did you just feel the water calling you was it something kind of is it something you always want to do or, or were you doing this for the film and you started feeling no, the, I, the, the I, was surf, I was surfing before i ever you know knew about acting you know i started surfing when i was 12 years old I, I i started surfing in palos verdes i was just like one of those you know timing luck you know my dad moved down to la from northern california and he got a house and there's a beach nearby and there's some good surf. There's some excellent surfing nearby. I didn't know it at the time, but eventually I learned, he I had to learn how to swim. And then there was a beach and kids were surfing. And it was in the sixties, late 69, 70, whatever. And I just started hanging out with my friends and surfing kind of a latchkey kid, you know, you know, I could do whatever I wanted. And 
I found surfing, you know, when I was in seventh grade and I just, I liked it more than anything. And so that's all I did, you know, like all I did high school surfing and acting and start, you know, by the time I was in high school, it was just surfing and acting, you know? And so when I went to college, surfing and acting, and then when I decided to be an actor, I stopped surfing for a while. I, I just focused on acting and living in a city, how Hollywood works, what cities are like. I'd never lived in a city. I was just literally a suburban kid at, at the beach. And as it turns out, I love the city and I love nightclubs and music and go and the city. I just started going to cities and studying acting for years. And it wasn't until I got the movie North Shore that my hero, Jerry Lopez, who was working in the movie and is great. He I told him what I've been up to. You know, and he goes, John, you know, one, well, you should never quit surfing again. Now that you're back into it, you know, you're doing it for this movie, you realize, you know, it's a big part. You should never quit. Don't ever quit because it's cheap. It's free. It's this free form of exercise that you can do all around the world for the rest of your life. You'll never regret it if you, if you just keep doing it. And I did. Ever since that movie, I've been surfing. I mean, probably, you know, much to the, you know, it definitely took away from my career as an actor mm -hmm. because I would go do a shoot a movie in the Philippines. And then I would go to Bali and Indonesia because I'm already in Southeast Asia. Um, I would just go to the surf Mecca and just surf for another month and then come home. And I did that every fucking year, you know, and it, it became just a, a part of my life would be go on these surf trips to Indonesia. And that was so important to me. And, you know, it was, it was hard on my agent and my career because they'd be like, Oh, you just did a movie. You know, this thing came out, but you weren't around. People wanted to meet you, but you were in, you were surfing in Bali. Like what I'm at a desk with a fucking suit and tie on in LA five days a week for 10 hours a day. I wonder what, you know, I'm working my ass off and you're, you know, you're just like, Oh, I, I'm going to go surfing, but surfing meant a lot to me for my mental health. And it turns out when I stopped working as an actor, I, I started teaching surfing and that, that kind of re-inspired my career. I got healthy again. People would throw me little bones and little movies because they'd see me teaching surfing. And I go, you're that actor from the thing. Will you be in my little movie? And I'm like, yes, I will. Oh, I so you just, just stay alive. You never know what's going to happen. The wheel turns for everybody and hope springs eternal, but surfing uh, it has meant everything to me. Yeah. Surfing really helped save my life. That's great. Did you see the momentum movement documentary? Yeah. Oh God. That's a, good, right? that's a beautiful movie. Yeah. It's really good. There's some great, filmmakers that were like, you know, young, growing up and they're looking at surfing and they're going, this is so beautiful and cool. And these stories are interesting and they have technical skills. They learn how to make movies. And some of those movies are just fascinating. Yeah. To me, it was almost like that Catherine Bigelow uh, thing with the uh, same thing, what they did with the momentum movie that they did with uh, Dogtown in the Z yeah. board, with the skateboard. And they didn't realize what they were doing by doing all that. They didn't know they were filming history, but they were. Same exact thing, yes. Yep. Yeah. Stacy Peralta does a documentary about a, something that that he knows personally, but he also has filmmaking skills. And all of a sudden, people are exposed to this really cool thing. And then they make a Hollywood movie about it with, with you know, you know, Hardwick, Catherine Hardwick, who, who directed that Hollywood movie and also Twilight, mm -hmm. she, was this pro, she was the set designer for Tombstone. So the reason Tombstone, the bars and everything looks so fucking cool is because the artist, Catherine Hardwick, was not a director yet. She was the set designer on Tombstone. That's it's awesome. Cool. Well, look, everybody starts somewhere. And that's yeah. why that's why she's such a successful director. Yeah. Oh. She just she's a talent. Yeah, that's that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I went back up to. uh Point break because oh, yeah. I just think he's a freaking awesome guy. I think he's general, genuine. I, he's not. He doesn't have that whole Hollywood rock star thing. But I mean, is there anything you could share about Keanu Reeves as a person? Yes. Yeah. I can. I mean, my experience with Keanu was so good. I, he um he was always, and he I think he always will be the smartest guy in any room he walks into. He's got like a photographic memory and he's really interested in astronomy and physics and philosophy and literature. So everything, and he just consumes it. So everything he's ever read or seen, he's the smart, you know, he knows everything about everything, but he, he would never let you know that. Uh -huh. So when you see him like talk on an inner, on an inter, people are just, they kind of Colbert kind of figured him out and stuff. He just realized 
you know, he's Keanu's got this image like he, he, you know, the way he talks and everything, people think he's not intelligent, not smart, and he's smarter than everyone. But <laughs> yeah. he just is so humble and he just doesn't want anyone to ever feel uncomfortable. You know, he's so sweet and nice and and he just likes being a human being, you know, where people are nice to each other. And even though he is, you know, some people might say he's a superior human being, you know, I mean, he's just a special guy, but fucking coolest dude, smartest guy in the room. If anywhere he ever goes, smarter than everyone, never let you know it. That's awesome. Yeah. You'd have to catch him, you know, and when his, when his, defenses are down if somebody some host or something asks him a deep question he can he'll quickly talk about things that just blow the host's mind and then he'll pull back away and go and then try to dumb it down again it's really <laughs> funny to watch really funny to watch <laughs> there uh any funny moment or any particular moment that stuck out with you in the movie point break during the you mean during during the filming or whatever you know any particular moment that's uh that that we could share with an audience that people might make people pop. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Uh, we had to do some skydiving in the movie and Patrick was a skydiver and he had decided he was going to do his own stunts in the skydiving. I believe I heard this and they, he wasn't insured, right? We're, no one is. <laughs> and when you're making a movie, you, you're not insured to go up in a skydiving plane because those planes are not insured. Hmm. So, so it's a breach it's a, of your contract to go up in a skydiving and jump out of an airplane. It's a breach of contract when you're making a studio film. I didn't really, you know, I suspected at the time, but every, every weekend Patrick goes, I'm jumping in Paris Valley. You want to come? I'm like, yeah. Me and James would grow. We're, we're like, yeah, we want to go jump. And we go hang out with Patrick. We go down to Paris Valley. We jump out of a plane as many times as we could while he's training. And we're just doing our accelerator free fall courses it's all on film it's the best fucking movie i've ever seen is me like falling over backwards and kicking like a cat and flying in the air and all of a sudden you get your balance and you're like i'm flying it's so fucking bitch and i've never done anything like it and i'll probably never do anything like that again but anyway after we'd done it a couple times the producers found out that we had been driving up to, and skydiving i don't know how they found out but they found out <laughs> And they threw a shit fit and they were yelling at us. I just remember them yelling at me, just going, have you got any idea, you know, that the problems, the money you cost and how that's a breach of contract, we'd sue you, you know, and they're talking, you know, and I was like, okay, yeah, all right, I get it. Sorry. You know, like, okay, I didn't know. Sorry. I'm cool. And then like, I swear to God that day, like, like an hour later, Patrick's like, you want to go skydiving this weekend? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> And we'd still do it, you know? And once, like, it's funny, you're in a plane, you're wearing this shit, you're all, you're all next to each other, and the door opens, and it's so loud and so scary, and you start moving forward. And I just remember turning around, and I'd see Keanu Reeves in the plane. I'm like, that's fucking Keanu Reeves. Like, I didn't train with him, but, you know, and I go, what is he doing jumping out of a perfectly good airplane? But he went up and jumped, too. Oh, wow. you know, He's fucking that cool. It's no joke, man. But, so yeah. I, 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 are you saying this was actual part of the shoot, or is this just for you guys having fun? No, this is us researching role the role. <laughs> this is us doing our research. You know, like <laughs> some people get really into it. Like Keanu knows kung fu. It's not like you know he has, yeah. he does the stunts that he can do. So he went up there and jumped out of airplanes. You know, as Keanu Reeves, you know, learning so that he could bring versatility as an actor to it. You know, I mean that there's nothing cooler than that. I don't think. I mean, that was fucking blew my mind to go, there's Keanu Reeves, you know, like Patrick say, we're all jumping out of this fucking perfectly good airplane. So it was very exciting part and we were illegal and really, you know, <laughs> I'm really glad I did it, but it really drove the producers crazy, which I understand, you know, luckily there were no accidents. I mean, like, uh, you know, you just never know though. It's dangerous. Like, surfing's dangerous too, but uh, that's all really I came so down to. I mean, I'm sure they cared about you too, but if any of you were to die and you shot all this footage, you know, like you're, break your leg. Exactly. Yeah, or die. Yeah. yeah. Die or break your ankle. You know, like it's one of the others skydiving. You either like you either fracture your ankle when you land or you die. But I mean, you don't, you don't die from skydiving. You die from the plane ride up. That's why the planes aren't insured. Like that plane we jumped out of all of us, Patrick, Keanu, me, that plane went down. 
and killed 15 skydivers a year, two years later. Oh, wow. And that's what, that's the tragedy of skydiving, you know, jump sites is those planes are just so shitty. You know, they're so cheap and they, they don't, the FAA won't insure those planes uh, that take skydivers up because you all have a parachute. And that's why you need to learn how to do a hop and pop. Part of your training for the accelerated free fall courses, you know, the ground's right fucking there. And they're, and when you get up, you know, really low, they're like, okay, jump and pull. So that when the plane eventually has a malfunction and it has to land and go down, they want to make sure they can get everybody out and under canopy fast. And so you have to do a hop and pop, which is the most horrifying thing in the whole wide world. Crazy. But it's for your own safety. I don't want to jump here. I can't even I see the fucking see my car. Oh, <laughs> what if I shoot malfunctions? Awesome. <laughs> no, that never happened. I never had. We had a great time. Sweet. Well, John, uh, love to uh, thank you for so much for oh, being yes. on Average Superstar TV. Is there anything you would like to plug or say? I always like to get uh, the floor. Yeah, I did this movie called Undateable John. It's on Amazon Prime. I think it's really funny, but I play my kind of a version of myself. I don't play me, but I play a version of myself, a surf instructor, you know, who's struggling with uh, sobriety. And it's really funny. Sweet, sweet. And if anybody needs to contact you, uh, well, I'm so I'm the easiest guy in the world. It's my name right there. You can Google me. You can go to my website, Pro Surf Instruction. I'm so easy to find. And give my love to Heather. Love loves horror. Uh, Heather, thank you so much for this fine score. Yeah, you're, you're my little well, angel. And, well, that was that was fun. Thank you. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank anyone who took the time to watch this show. Thank you for stopping by Average Superstar TV. Feel free to subscribe, comment, and share. And uh, we have a new episode every Monday at 5 a.m. So tune in for further episodes. John, I thank you so much again. Thank you.